Well, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, we have a very special event today, and I, I'm particularly pleased to see all our veterans sitting up here in the front two rows here in Kansas City. And if you're a veteran sitting out there in the back, you're supposed to be up here. But we'll, we'll let it go today. Um, so today, I am very happy to be able to give you an opportunity to meet our special guest, General Richard Myers. Uh, General Myers is former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he served in the period immediately following 9-11. I believe you, you were installed within just a couple weeks after 9-11. Um, and directing the United States st strategy for the war on terrorism, overseeing our actions in Iraq and Afghanistan. He served for over 40 years in the Air Force, including over 600 combat hours in Vietnam. Now, all of that's remarkable, but, but he's a member of our board of directors as well. So, uh, grew up here in the Kansas City area and uh, attended Kansas State University, Matt. All right, see, there we go. <laughs> Uh, tonight, General Myers is here. We had a board meeting this morning, but he's going to be attending our annual dinner at the downtown at the Weston Crown Center, and he's going to join a very impressive list of past recipients of our MRI Global's Trustees Citation Award, and we'll be giving a talk tonight. You know, as you're going to see, he, he's an inspiring and visionary guy. Um, we're, we're really proud to have him here to speak with us about leadership lessons he's learned during his extraordinary career. Let me introduce to you General Richard B. Myers, so help me. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for that. Uh, it's, well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. It's a uh, pleasure for lots of reasons. Uh, a real honor to be on the MRI Global Board of Directors, which I've been on, I guess, for a couple of years now, I suppose. Um, and I'm not sure I've been value added yet, but I hope in the future I'll be value added. Um, and it's always good to be associated with something in Kansas City. I don't live here anymore. I live in Northern Virginia, but my heart's here. And so I still have a relationship at Kansas State where I, I do some work for them and it necessitates coming back from time to time. And there's really nothing I enjoy more than I usually land at MCI, rent a car and drive out to Manhattan. And people say, well, why don't you fly out to Manhattan? So I like to drive. It reminds me of a place I grew up, and um, I made that drive many times when I was in college. And it just brings back all kinds of good memories and keeps me connected to my roots, which for me is important. I wish I could be back um, more often. Air Force career, I went through Air Force ROTC at Kansas State, and the plan was to serve my five years of commitment, four years after pilot training, and get out. And, uh, you know, five years turned to 10, turned to 15, turned to 40. And uh, it was never the plan. And I, nobody in my family had served in the military. Uh, I, I really didn't know what I was getting into when I got into it. And then I found out that I really <laughs> enjoyed it, enjoyed the flying, that I enjoyed the other responsibilities that eventually come your way. And um, so unless you think I, I came from this great military background, in fact, people all the time say, well, you must have gone to one of the service academies. I said, no, I went to Kansas State, went through Reserve Officer Training Corps, ROTC, and, and then uh, took a commission and went in and learned to fly, and the rest is, is what it'll be. I thought we've got about an hour together, a little less now, and so I'd like to talk about leadership for just a little bit of time, maybe 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll do questions on, and, and answers on anything you want to talk about. Um, the, the, the thoughts on leadership I'm going to share with you uh, revolve around what I call strategic leadership. But I think these principles probably apply uh, at, at most any level of leadership. But given the, the nature of the kind of folks that work at MRI and the kind of things you do and the levels of responsibility that most of you have, uh, I think strategic leadership probably fits, uh, fits this topic pretty well. And I'm going to talk about six characteristics of strategic leadership that um, this is after I retired. I have a, a gig at National Defense University. I co-teach a, turns out to be an ethics course uh, with a real professor and I'm the practitioner and we, I can regale the students with, with stories and he regales them with 
the foundation of what they're supposed to be learning. But but together we're a really good team, and uh, <laughs> we get gr well. I think we're good. We get great critiques. We're happy with that part of it. But it was um, the two of us collaborated on this idea of strategic leadership and and maybe what's different about leadership once you get out of the tactical level, once you get to the operational or strategic level. And I, like I say, I think these characteristics apply probably to any level, but I'll sort of refer to them at the strategic level, which, uh, again, I think most of you probably touch or work in uh, most, most of the time. And I think these are particularly appropriate for the 21st century. I think you could, some of these might not have been as important decades ago, but I think they're really important now. So let me go through them. And again, in the Q&A, if you want to debate this, I'm open to that. Uh, we can debate it, but uh, I'm going to go through them, and then we'll, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. Maybe before I get going, I got to, you know, if I were still in uniform, these, this whole front row or second row had been filled with my staff. And so those, you all served, did you? And so, and you know that us generals, we got all these folks around us to make sure we can't screw it up too bad. And um, so I'd, my aide would be there, my public affairs person would be there in case the media wanted to talk to me. I'd probably have uh, at least one or two security people, particularly after 9-11, would be there. My speechwriter would be there. Uh, sometimes my executive assistant would be there. So, you know, you're talking about five, six, or seven people that would accompany you. And now it's just me, although we did, we did get delivered. Uh, three of three board members got delivered in this huge limousine that somebody went in for today, which was a little embarrassing coming in the parking lot with this, you know, like you're going to the high school prom. <laughs> we weren't going to the prom, we're going to simply go into a board meeting. But other than that, I basically get around on my own and do pretty well. Um, but at some point in your career, when you, when you think you've been somebody, uh, you get your comeuppance. And so um, one of the stories they tell on General Eisenhower is that uh, after he retired from the military, he's in his office, he's got an assistant, and he calls the assistant in, says, get in here, there's something wrong with this phone system. He says, here, listen to that. The assistant says, General, that's the dial tone. <laughs> and, and, and I think there's, I, I mentioned that at Abilene one time at the uh, Eisenhower uh, Library out there, and the, and, and the uh, curator said, uh, did not uh, validate that was an accurate story or not. But, so my comeuppance is this, let me give you my comeuppance. I've been retired, it was about this time of year back in northern Washington, uh, uh, Washington D.C., uh, northern Virginia, and I'm trying to move from a very big army house into a very small townhouse that now I, I can afford. And um, so I was taking some things to Goodwill, this is my Goodwill story, so I'm taking all these things to Goodwill, and it was a day just, just like today, it was October, about the middle of October, been retired about two weeks. And um, I get to the Goodwill place, and it's a pretty big complex there in uh, in Arlington, uh, Virginia, and I drive in and I see these two big trucks where you drop off, you've been to Goodwill, so these big trucks where you drop stuff off. I said, man, it's just me and those, I, I'll be out of here in a, in a heartbeat, I don't have to wait in line. The problem was there was a Goodwill truck blocking my, my way, so I, I told the driver, I stuck my house the window and told the driver, I said, you're asking, could you just back up a couple of feet and I'll get around you and, he's, and get over and donate my stuff? And he says, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> And if you know, if you look carefully behind me on the blacktop, there was a faded white arrow pointing the other direction. I, I admit that I did not see that. So I said, okay, I'm going the wrong way, but it's just you and me in the parking lot. And if you could just back up to the fence over here, I said, just back up two feet. I'll get by you and then I'll come out the right way for sure. And he says one more time, you're going the wrong way. <laughs> so we had a discussion, went on for a while and finally, with a look that I, I can't describe to you, but, uh, but it wasn't a pleasant one, the, um, the young man backs his truck up two feet, and I get by him and, and, then on the, and do my thing. And, and then on the way home, I'm thinking, okay, I've been retired two weeks. So what, have I, what would I have been doing, you know, a month ago or two months ago this time of day? Well, you could be meeting with the President of the United States, or you could be meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or you could be meeting with the Secretary of Defense. So what was I doing now that I was retired? I was spending... 40 years of everything I learned about tack and diplomacy, trying to get a truck driver to back up <laughs> two feet. And that's when I figured, you know, he didn't know who I was. He, no need for him to know. He shouldn't know. He shouldn't care. I was going the wrong way. He's pointed out. And, uh, and life will go on. That was my comeuppance and brought me back to a reality that I thought, I think my family did a pretty good job keeping me in the first place. Okay, back to, that has nothing to do with strategic leadership, by the way. That was, that was a story. Uh, strategic leadership. 
Um, first characteristic, I think, of a strategic leader or somebody that, that um, wants to lead in the 21st century would be an intellectual openness. You all know better than most. There's no problem that is solved by, by one person's ideas. It takes a lot of collaboration. In fact, um, I mean, you may be the smartest person in the room on whatever the subject is, but probably to solve the problem, you're going to need other ideas. So to me, strategic leadership, uh, one of the key, key points is a, a, an openness to other intellectual ideas. And, and if you're leading, not just an openness, but to encourage them from your subordinates. Make sure that everything's on the table, not, not feel like uh, somehow your, your uh, knowledge is being, uh, not being respected when somebody says, well, here's another idea, here's another idea. I think the good leaders kind of bring it, bring it all to the table so you can sort through the different ideas. I mean, it's a complex world. There is no single idea, no single person, in my view, that can figure it out on their own. It's all about the strategic leader trying to, trying to pull this from many different directions. And there may be places that are uncomfortable or people that you don't necessarily want to hear from because, you know, a thousand ideas from this person may be just awful. A thousand and first might be brilliant. And so you have to tolerate some of that. So as a leader, it can be frustrating, but I think it's absolutely essential if you're going to lead in, in this environment that we all work in. You probably, you know this, I mean, you could give your own stories and maybe we will in the, in the Q&A. So the, the first point under street leadership is this, this whole notion of an intellectual openness. Uh, the second point would be the ability to deal with nuance. Now, a lot of you are technical people, and a lot of the solutions, you know, you went to three decimal places. I went, I went through mechanical engineering at Kansas State. Thank goodness that they, uh, they uh, graded on the curve up there. Uh, because I remember getting a heat transfer test back one time. It had a 10 on it. And I'm thinking, that's not close to 100. That's not very good, I don't think. And I looked around, and my 10 stood pretty good. I mean, I was not, I mean, I wasn't number one, but it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as some threes and fours I saw floating around. Um, so, I mean, if you're, if we're technical people, we, we know we want things to, uh, three decimal points, six decimal points, whatever. Some of the work's even tighter than that. I understand that. Um, but in the, in the world of leadership, rarely do you get decisions that are to three, four, five, six decimal points. You know, and, 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 and some of your options aren't always obvious, and there can be a great deal of cognitive dissonance as you're looking at a problem uh, where you're, you're fighting within yourself on what you really believe and which direction to go. This is, I think, natural. The only point is, uh, if you're going to be a good leader, I think in this 21st century, at the operational strategic level, you've got to be able to deal with this nuance in a way that is constructive. A way not to deal with it is to just ignore it. I mean, that's not going to make it go away. You've got to be able to deal with this and try to find other facts, figures, whatever, the arguments you need to build your confidence that maybe you're on the, on the right track. Uh, working with Secretary Rumsfeld, he, was, he would come to the hardest problems and always say, I don't have conviction on this yet. And he could be conflicted. You could see that. He'd be conflicted on an idea. And the way he worked his way through it is just to keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, the issue intellectually until he started to develop some conviction. That's how he dealt. Uh, a good example would be the anthrax vaccine for military members. Um, they stopped because the production facility uh, was no, no longer certified. So we had to stop our series. I think it was seven shots we got for anthrax. And I got four of them, I think. And then we also, boom, we're stopped until we get the facility back online. Facility gets certified by FDA. We're up and producing again. The question is, do we go back and do it, continue the series? Is this, uh, are they safe and effective and all that sort of stuff? He brought in a Nobel Prize winning uh, virologist who knows all about the anthrax vaccine. And uh, we had a round table with this distinguished doctor of medicine. And uh, he says, it's safe, it's effective. What you do is your business, whether you want to vac vaccinate troops or not, but I can tell you it's safe and effective and all these sorts of things. You would think that would have ended it. That would have been the end of the discussion. You can't get much better than a Nobel Prize winning virologist talking about immunizations, to me anyway. That did not end it. He was, he was just as likely, in fact he did, he would go in the hall and he grabs some soldier going down the hall and says, 
what do you think about the anthrax vaccine? Oh, sir, you know, you read about that, it'll cause you to ears to fall off, it's really bad stuff, or whatever it was. He would just go seek lots of other uh, input to kind of deal with the, the nuances of, and try to understand all the nuances of the decision that he would eventually, eventually make. Uh, most, most subjects are really shades of gray. This one to me was a little bit more black and white. Okay, it's safe, it's effective, let's do it. It's gonna protect us, it's gonna, whatever. And um, I tried that argument several times and got kicked around and, well, we still gotta talk to so-and-so and we gotta talk to so-and-so. He finally decided the right way, but he was, he was about eight months past where I would have decided it. Um, I, don't, I think that's a good skill to have, frankly. And sometimes you have to not maybe take all that time, but to, to, to try to understand the nuances and, and that you may be pulled a couple different directions and be able to deal with it in a rational, logical way. So intellectual openness, the ability to deal with um, nuance. The third one would be intellectual agility. In the military, we grew up with our, our doctrine and our standard operating procedures. So we're, we're comfortable with that. And when, when the going gets tough and we have decisions to make, we often fall back on our, our doctrine. So as Tom said, I came into office on October 1st, seven days later, we're at war in Afghanistan. And between 9-11 and October 7th, when we went to war, we spent a lot of time talking about, well, okay, if we're gonna go into Afghanistan, how are we gonna do it? Huge US troop presence, um, leverage the, uh, the Northern Alliance. What are we going to do? Well, we decided that we would put special forces with Northern, a small number of special forces with Northern Alliance troops, and maybe they would help us fight the Taliban, look for the Al Qaeda, and so forth. That's the, that's the path we chose. The, and that we would do close air support with aircraft like the B 1 and the B 52, which have not traditionally been in a close air support regime, but they're connected because they got GPS guided weapons. They're connected to the people on the ground through communications that are giving them very precise target coordinates. So it was, I mean, it was a whole different way of using the force. It was not anybody's doctrine. If you'd looked to doctrine, you probably would have done it in a different, different way. And I would submit that at least the first part of the Afghan piece went actually pretty well and Kabul fell uh, in, a, in a little over two months and nobody actually expected that to happen. Uh, that fast, so it was it was a very successful sort of uh, sort of operation, and I think it was the intellectual agility of the commander of Central Command, General Franks, uh, the director of the CIA, who had they had their own views, to have the agility to move off the standard doctrine we'd all been brought up with. The example I like to use on how not to do this is uh, when I was commander of U.S. Forces Japan, we were having an exercise with our Japanese partners. It was a command post exercise, and I was going in eight o'clock in the morning for the morning briefing where they brief you up on where the exercise is, and you make a few decisions and you move on. And I, I had a little prep book that wasn't, you know, just a little skin, skinny notebook that I'd been given to, to get up to speed on where the exercise was. And in walks a major with uh, those big legal briefcases, and he had three or four of them. I mean, he could barely get into the, into the the, the situation room where we were having our, the command post where we're having our, our, uh, our discussions. And I'm thinking, did my staff not give me all the books I should have been reading? What is this about? <laughs> so I asked the major, I said, hey, major, what's all, <laughs> major so-and-so, what's all that stuff? He says, well, sir, as you know, I'm your special forces representative and that's our doctrine. And I'm here to make sure you employ us in a doctrinally correct manner. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I didn't tell him at the time, I thought to myself, well, he's not going to be any help because we're, we were dealing with the end of the Cold War, defending Japan, and maybe uh, with all the assumptions of the Cold War gone away. So, you know, how are we, how are we going to do this and, you know, first, who's the enemy and how are we going to deal with it? And, and maybe this isn't Russia that we're, so, or the Soviet Union. And here's a guy who's going to make sure we employ in a doctrinally correct manner. Intellectual agility in the 21st century, no matter what we're doing, I think, the ability not to always rely on doctrine. That's good, it's gotta be developed. The procedures, everything we use here at MRI, all good stuff, that's the foundation. But the agility to, to think on our own and perhaps uh, move to more effective solutions given the problems are gonna, gonna be probably different than we're uh, around when we developed all that doctrine. Okay, fourth piece is, uh, I think a strategic leader is a great integrator. 
Um, we all have our, our skill sets, and it kind of goes back to the little bit about intellectual openness. Um, no one skill set, no one group, no one office, no one part of the chain of command, uh, no one tech, no one technical discipline is going to be able to provide the answer to the problem, to the, to, the, to the issues we have today and the challenges. It just doesn't happen anymore, or very rarely. And if it does, probably doesn't need a lot of strategic leadership to get us there because the answer is obvious. But the really tough ones require, you know, a multi, um, uh, multi-discipline sort of approach to it. And this whole notion of being an integrator if you're a leader is making sure that when you're working on an issue, you're pulling in the other pieces that can help make this work, whether they're inside your unit or you've got to go across the transom to somebody else. Hard to do sometimes. I mean, we all like to kind of, we all have our tribes, right? I mean, we all have, in the military, we got our, we got our service tribes, and in each, side, in each service you got tribes. Who served here in the Navy? Okay, so I'm, I'm at this one-star course for newly minted one-star officers called Capstone. Congress uh, dictated this course because they wanted the services to work better together, and they, one of the courses is this one-star course. I remember going to the, the Pentagon and visiting uh, the Navy, kind of the, their command center, and as you walk in, they have in the floor, almost in bronze, I don't know what the medium was, but in the floor, like it's supposed to be there for the eternity, the three devices, and you can guess what the devices would be. You'd have dolphins for the submariners. You'd have a surface warfare device for the surface warfare folks. And you had the naval uh, aviation wings, aviator wings. They, had, they have three tribes in the Navy. Those tribes are as live and well today as they were when I walked across those things in the late 80s. Um, I, I chose an EA when I was chairman. One of the, I had several EAs, executive assistants, and I chose one and I chose, I, one, of the, one of the candidates was a Navy submariner. I did not choose him, I, choose, I chose another Navy officer, surface warfare guy actually. I didn't know one was one or one, I mean that was not part of what I was thinking about, but the feedback came back to me, it says, well, you really, you really made the submarine force really mad. They don't think you like submariners. <laughs> oh, come on. This is about integrating the force. This is about integrating capabilities and they have to come they can come from lots of places uh, and of course we have lots of partnerships here at MRI some of that integration has to be done with other companies some of them are our competitors at I mean it's just kind of the nature of how we do business but I think good strategic leaders are, are adept at bringing in and integrating other ideas and thoughts from, from maybe non-traditional groups that perhaps you're you're not always comfortable, as comfortable working with as you are, as you are your own group. Um, the next one would be teamwork. A little bit like, a little bit like uh, integration, but 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 different. Um, I think we all appreciate teamwork. Certainly, in the military, we appreciate teamwork. Pretty important part of what we, how we how we get the job done. Um, it was certainly true. And back, and back just the way on integration a little bit, part of the job as chairman is to integrate all your instruments of national power. So you know the military instrument pretty well. I mean, you've been, you know, the chairman and your staff, you, you know the military piece. My job was to integrate into our operations, the State Department, Treasury, Justice, Commerce to some cases, certainly the White House and some of the expertise they had on the uh, National Security Council staff, uh, in, and CIA, other intel agencies, integrate all that. That was. And if I did a good job of that, then I think, well, he's a pretty good strategic leader. If you ignored all that and thought, well, we'll just kind of do our military piece, you're really letting the nation down. So that's, that's the integration piece. Maybe that says it again a little differently that helps you understand where I'm coming from. Teamwork. Um, pretty easy for me to, do, to work teamwork on inside the joint staff. And you can say, well, sure it is, Myers. I mean, you're the four star and they all work for you. Well, yeah, but true, true, but um, not many people know the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has no command responsibility. Zero. Zip. Nada. You have no command. So all the people who work for me, actually, if they ever got in trouble, they needed some uh, UCMJ action, some, some 
administrative or, or legal action, that was all done through their services. I didn't own anybody. No, I, I had people that the services would let me use, and they were on what call was called the joint staff, and they paid a lot of respect to me, but I didn't own them. I mean, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't tell them to do anything, basically. Well, I did, but I mean, you could, <laughs> <laughs> I think you get, I think you get the point. So, so you build your, you build your team inside the joint staff, but there's other teamwork. So inside the Department of Defense, uh, one of the most important offices for uh, the military to work with is the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, because that's where a lot of the hard issues are thought about and proposals brought to the Secretary of Defense. And um, it took until about, I think, the summer of 01, the new Bush administration comes in early 01, to get an Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. I'm sorry, this was, uh, this was um, actually beyond that. This was late in 01 when they named him. And uh, I'd been installed as chairman, and I had a vice chairman, General Pete Pace, Marine Corps. And we find out who the new Undersecretary of Defense for Policy is, and I went to General Pace and I said, do you know him? And General Pace says, I don't know him. Uh -uh. I said, well, your, your task is to go make him your new best friend. Because if we're going to be a team here in the Department of Defense, we need to know what these folks in policy are thinking about. We don't want to wind up in front of the Secretary of Defense uh, coming at a problem from wildly different angles. We may go to the Secretary of Defense and have issues, but we should, we should do our best to work through a lot of those and try to develop a pretty good solution, or at least some options for the Secretary without going up there and just beating on each other, which would happen occasionally because we couldn't agree. So I think that notion of teamwork, certainly there's a team that we all, we all know how to build our team, but it's teamwork with, with folks you need as part of the solution, but that you don't, that don't work inside your own organization. And I think a strategic leader looks at that kind of teamwork and is effective in bringing those kind of teams together. And I, I would say here at MRI that uh, probably a pretty rich environment for that given all the for all the various folks that we have to have to work with uh, and the last point on strategic leadership would be uh, never forgetting your moral compass as we as we do whatever we do uh, it's easy to do when you get really really busy and you're working really really hard and this organization has really been stretching lately uh, you can just you can see it in the numbers. I didn't see the numbers today. Tom Fleener doesn't show me them very often, but I know we, um, revenues are going up. We've got a lot of proposals out. We, we're working hard. People are working, most people are working really, really hard. And um, in the midst of all that, you can't forget, you know, how you were brought up, what the church taught you, what the school taught you, what your parents taught you, uh, what the country taught you, what our heritage is, all that sort of stuff has to be with you and at some point you may have to step back and say wait a minute you know we've got these we have very noble ends that we're trying to achieve here but are we are we doing it by the, the right means I mean we can all agree these ends are very noble but not every way to get there is, is probably ethical or moral and um, it's just a caution to strategic leaders as you get caught up in, in events, sometimes you can forget that, and you'll come out with an outcome, and you'll later look at it and say, whoa, are we doing the right thing? I mean, it's, we all came to this conclusion. Uh, I'll give you an example that uh, I think works pretty well, at least from, from, that I was involved in, and that had to do with the applicability of the Geneva Conventions for our conflict in Afghanistan. The applicability of our Geneva Conventions with our um, conflict in Afghanistan. And what you need to know is that both Af the Af Afghanistan and the United States both ratified the conventions. So I'm on an over overseas trip and I get a memo from the Secretary of Defense and it says, pursuant to the President's decision uh, that says the Geneva Conventions do not apply to our conflict in Afghanistan, we got to take the following actions. And I'm thinking, wow, that's a big deal. I don't remember having this debate or ever being asked. So. In my discussion with the Secretary of Defense, I said, did you sign off? On, or well, first I went to Pete Pace, my, my advice, and I let him sign off. I said, anything you think you're man enough to handle, sign off on it, and we'll talk about it when I get back to keep things moving. I thought, well, I think that's a fair thing to do. We got a lot of stuff to do, and if I'm on a trip and you're waiting for me to come back, just get it done, because we actually had a pretty good mind meld on most all the issues. And I said, think you're man enough to do it, and we'll talk about it later. 
and if I and rarely would I ever disagree with some with his position. We saw things pretty well together. I said, Pete, did you did I miss a meeting? Did you go to a meeting in the White House that talked about this? No, nope, we never discussed it. And what the secretary said, Mr. Secretary, did you happen to have a meeting in the White House about your military advisor present? Because I don't remember discussing it. He says, No, we never discussed it. And I said, I think it's important that we have this discussion. I laid out the reasons. Um, I think this has gone too fast and that we, the Department of Defense, ought to have a at least a say in it. And he was good enough to call Dr. Rice, Connie Rice, who set up a meeting, a National Security Council meeting with the President and others, and we discussed uh, the applicability of the Geneva Conventions to our conflict in Afghanistan. And it was interesting to hear the Department of Justice rationale for why they don't apply. The reason they didn't apply is that, uh, and their rationale is that Afghanistan is a failed state, and therefore, how could a failed state be a party to a convention? And blah? Well, it's really tortured logic. And, and the, the, the President, who a lot smarter than you might think, so he's sitting there thinking about this, he says, okay. So he asks his Attorney General, he says, well, would you say Iraq is a failed state? This is when Saddam was still in power, because they got this horrible dictator and all this sort of stuff. He said, yeah, you could say Iraq's a failed state. And the President says, aha, this is, this is, we're making up the rules to go with where we want to go here, when in fact there are international conventions that we have to, we've signed up to. These are, these are our obligations. So we were successful in beating that back to a degree. We didn't get all the way back, but we got it so at least the conventions applied uh, to our conflict with Afghanistan. We still couldn't agree on uh, combatants and what their status would be, that we, and that's a whole other argument. But that's an example of, of at least, if I hadn't been on, the, on a trip where I had a little bit more time on an airplane coming home from who knows where, but probably a 10 or 12 hour flight where you can read through this and think about it, maybe in the, in the haste of the day you'd just kind of blown by it. So it's just a caution for folks that are working at leadership at the higher levels that every once in a while step back and say, are we doing the right thing here? And uh, are, we doing, are we doing the thing that's morally correct? Is it ethically correct? Just a reminder. That, those are my six points. Openness, nuance, understanding how to deal with nuance, agility, integration, teamwork, and moral compass. So with that, we can open it up to questions on any subject you want to talk about. And you better be careful about how much you assume I know about MRI Global. <laughs> I, I know a lot about some pieces of it, and the pieces I know most about I can't talk about, actually. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm, so I'm still learning, but I'm happy to, I'll, I'll give it a shot anyway, so. Okay, we have any questions? Yeah. There are gonna be questions. How would you advise us or in, in your leadership sort of thought of dealing with the frustrations that kind of, I felt were implied in that part of it where you said, it took Rumsfeld eight months to make that decision to go ahead with the vaccine, and you thought, you know, let's go ahead and do it. So how do you deal with that frustration? You know, I guess in, in at least in the, the climate we were in, there were so many other issues bubbling and boiling around that, that while I was frustrated personally about that, you didn't have time to dwell on it because you're working the next issue and the next issue and the next issue. And at least in my tenure as chairman, we had so many issues that didn't have time to, to dwell on it, but I, um, and while frustrated, you know, I didn't go to the secretary, I might have done it once, but I mean, I, didn't, I wasn't on his doorstep all the time saying, Mr. Secretary, let's get on with it. You know, we're, we're, we're wasting valuable time. People are, it's gonna take us a long time to get the, our armed forces vaccinated. So when they go to places where anthrax may be a threat, that we can protect ourselves and, and uh, and if anything were to happen, and it could happen, uh, we're going to look pretty darn stupid that we procrastinated. I didn't. I didn't probably make that argument as strong as I could have. That, that's probably one on me as I think about it. I hadn't thought about it, but so I, you know, I went on to probably the next issue and kept working this one. And I, no doubt, I sent him several papers on it because I get. You all heard about the Rumsfeld snowflakes, the little mental things he'd write off to us, and I probably got several on this particular, particular issue. But it, it's. Uh, you know, I think is uh, when you're in that level of leadership, that there's going to be frustration. You just have to understand that's going to be part of this. It's not, it's not going to all be smooth, nor should it be. And there should be competing ideas. I mean, competition breeds excellence, in my view. So 
you know, if it's healthy competition, it can be frustrating because, you, you know, you're in there duking it out trying to win your point, get your point across. But it's not a bad thing. So I, how people handle that, I'm not doing a, I, I don't know that I can answer that uh, other than say that it's just, it kind of goes with, with the game. And some people are easier to work with than others. And you, you know that. I mean, some, some uh, and, and some make it more, more challenging. And, um, and, uh, and it doesn't mean necessarily, it doesn't mean they're bad if they make it more challenging. Sometimes that's just the way people are, the way other people are. So I think, I think that's all kind of individual. And my guess is here at MRI, kind of like the military, you don't, get the peop you don't always get to pick the person you work for. They probably get to pick you. And, um, and so you have to adapt to whatever style that people have. So I think, I think the bottom line, to keep it from being frustrating, is to work the relationship where it's a, it's a relationship built on trust, where the dialogue can be open and free and all cards on the table. And if somebody wants to take more time, then that's just the way life is and you just, but as lo long as you have an open, trusting relationship, that probably helps with the frustration as much as anything. And we all have to work on that. And, uh, and sometimes you, you have to work on it really hard. <laughs> it's still the right th exactly the right thing to do. Tom. Try again. So in your book you talk about engagement with um, kind of the, the regimes of the Middle East and that is really kind of the key to success, not just the military action and the like. Can you comment a little bit about what's happening today, kind of give us a grade on how we've done in your view and um, you know what's happening with the Arab Spring and, and, and your thoughts about how we might engage there? Uh, I think part of what uh, Tom's referring to is uh, and I just did a little NPR thing over here with uh, Steve Kraske from the Kansas City Star who does a program, I think, from 11 to 12. I guess it is that one. Yeah, 11 to 12. And I just did a, a piece with him. And one of the things I emphasized in the book, this is something I believe, and that is that the challenges that we face as a nation don't yield to one of just one instrument of power. Instruments of power are generally considered your military instrument of power. Diplomatic slash political is always considered an instrument of power. Economic instrument of power that a nation has. And I would add uh, a fourth one that is informational instrument of power, because information is, and the way we move it around today so quickly, I think, is an instrument of power in how we communicate and what we say and so forth. And um, I, I give us still pretty bad grades for using all instruments of power in our, in our current conflicts. And Afghanistan might be an example. Um, when I was there in 2005, the last time I was there, August 2005, right before I retired, the American embassy uh, through which all your instruments of power would flow because your ambassador would be your senior U.S. person in country, even though you might have a big military operation going on, the ambassador would be tagged as the one to bring all instruments of national power to bear on the problem, and a lot of those staff people would be in that embassy. That embassy was uh, manned at 40%. Um, that's not a good thing. I mean, if you're trying to bring economic or work the political and diplomatic uh, angles to develop Afghanistan. And so what's lagging today in Afghanistan? What's the biggest issue? It's the government in Kabul. It's, it's governance. The, 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 the security situation is getting better. Um, probably be an issue for a while, but it's, it's, it's getting uh, demonstrably better. But what's not getting better is, is the state of corruption of the Afghan government, uh, those sorts of things. What's the biggest issue in in Iraq right now. Well, they had elections two years ago this coming January. They still don't have a um, uh, defense minister, uh, interior security minister. So who's giving the orders to the troops? You know, we all got to be connected somebody. somebody. I mean, you can't, as an Air Force captain, I couldn't wander around and kind of figure out what I'm going to do today. Somebody was giving me orders, and, and I was connected up through various chains to the Secretary of Defense all the way to the Commander in Chief. And so you have to wonder if that connect, lack of connective uh, tissue you know, harms us in what we're doing. So, uh, the Arab Spring I, um, seemed to catch us a little bit by surprise. And I'm, I don't think we've had a good, and I, I don't know if you can, this is very complex. I don't think we've, as a country, done a particularly good job of having a, a good strategic view of how to, how to handle all that. And, um, and I think the Arab Spring, it's far from, far from um, 
being over in terms of the, the eventual outcome. Tunisia, we all, that was the first. Um, my impression of Tunisia was, well, they've got a different government and things are going pretty well. Until I met a, a lady at Aspen, we were at a seminar together out there this summer. She's Tunisian. She teaches law in Saudi Arabia to women. You probably didn't hear me. She teaches law <laughs> in Saudi Arabia to women. And a fascinating lady, but she's Tunisian. And I said, well, things must be going pretty well now in Tunisia. You've had, you know, you had overthrew the bad guy. He says, oh, no. He says, we're all really unhappy, just as corrupt as the last bunch. That hasn't changed. You look at Egypt. Uh, who's running Egypt right now? It's one of my friends, <laughs> one of the guys I know pretty well, and his military buddies are running the country, postponing elections. I mean, they're of the same cloth as Mubarak. So have we made progress? Is our intervention, are we helping in ways that are useful to, and I'm sure, I'm sure if you had people from the State Department or, or Defense, they would give you a list of things that are going on that, that I don't know about that I'm sure are, are really good because we're not stupid. But, but these are really tough problems. So I, I guess the, looking at it, knowing a little bit about the inside, what's going on inside, but looking at it from outside, I'd say we're, we're, you know, we're not doing great. Maybe a C. Maybe a C. We're not, we're not doing great. Tough problems, though. I mean, these are not, they don't yield uh, easily. Libya is undecided, um, confusing. Syria, and uh, on and on it goes. Pretty, pretty interesting times, right? General, I'd like to ask you a question about Mexico. Absolutely. Um, you, you brought up earlier uh, uh, kind of an example with the Geneva Convention and whether or not it applies to a failed state like Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you feel like with the situation with the cartels in Mexico that we might be heading towards that same route with engagement with our southern neighbor? Uh, when you say same route, you mean uh, con Con considering them a failed state? Um, mm. And whether or not, uh, how how bad does it have to get with violence to be able to classify them in that realm? You know, I heard the, I heard the Mexican ambassador to the United States give a speech this summer, give a presentation, and what an impressive. First, I wanted, I didn't I didn't do this, but I wanted to walk up to him afterwards and say, "Are you Mexican?" Because <laughs> because his language, I mean, his English is better than my English, so. But he went to school abroad as a young man, and, and but so I, oh, I said, you must speak Spanish, right? Or so, he was just the coolest guy, and said a lot of things about Mexico that I think would are, are kind of offset the the gang violence and the and the killings that we hear about a lot. One is that the employment in Mexico is lower than it is here in the United States. It's around four or five percent. A lot of the Mexican immigrants are now going back to Mexico because they can get jobs there where they can't get them here. I mean, that was one little factoid. He threw out several others that, that and he did, not, he, he did not dodge the issue of gangs and the killings. He did not dodge that. He, he addressed it. Um, what is hard to do and what is important to do, a little, little background. You know, the Mexican government has never really forgiven the United States for invading. Well, first of all, taking a lot of their land, but invading too. And so when I was in Mexico one time traveling with Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, we were at some event. I can't remember the event. Uh, President Clinton was there. And uh, while we were there, I had some downtime. They said, would you like to go meet, go over to the uh, military headquarters and meet with some senior Mexican officers? I said, I'd love to do that. I said, well, you're going to have to take your uniform off and you're going to have to go over there in a suit because there's such, they're so allergic to the U.S. uniform that they just, you know, it really upset them. I said, okay, I'll, whatever I have to do. Um, there, I, I think on the military to military front, there needs to be um, more trust. There is, there is some today, some trust that is built up, but it's really, really hard. I think on civilian agencies, we've done better. But I, uh, I don't think, I don't think this, the danger is a failed state. I mean, it might be, it's, it goes to extreme. I think what needs to happen is, is the United States providing them some of the capabilities to help them deal with this, whether it's uh, intelligence or surveillance or reconnaissance or training. 
uh, those sorts of things that could help them deal with this uh, maybe more uh, more appropriately. Um, it's it is a huge it is a it's a it's a game changing issue if you live on the anywhere near the border for you and your family it's a game changing issue that needs to be dealt with. But I see I think I think it's the door that will allow us more collaboration with Mexico, one of our bigger trading partners, an important country for us in lots of economic ways and cultural ways, um, and look for opportunities there to kind of help help them deal with this huge trouble. I, I think my personal opinion is I think we're a ways away from a failed state. They have they have a lot of good things going as well. I mean they got a lot of problems, but they got a lot of some good things going. By the way, I was trying to get into the good graces of my counterpart in Mexico, who was, he was the chief of staff of the Army and also the secretary of the Army. They don't, their civilian control of the military is a little different concept down there. The same guy was a civilian and the same guy was the military guy, so they just, and he was a delightful guy. His wife loved the New York Yankees, loved them. And at the time, one of the guys that went on a, a USO show with me to uh, Afghanistan, Roger Clemens, was still pitching for the Yankees. I said, aha, I can worm my way into his good graces through his wife. I'll get her a Yankees jacket, you know, autographed by Roger Clemens, which I did. And it helped a little bit, not very much. <laughs> a little bit, not a lot, but you know, you're looking for ways to kind of build the relationship beyond the, the formal relationship. Actually, when I retired, um, I had one of the most moving to me uh, sort of a farewell. He said, would you mind if we did a little farewell salute with the troops for you while you were visiting? Because I don't know how many times I've visited Mexico. I think more than any other chairman ever, um, ever had. And we round the corner and there are thousands of troops standing out there at attention. It was, I mean, it was a wonderful spectacle. Bad use of time, but a wonderful <laughs> spectacle. And, it, and, you know, to do something like that, we obviously made some progress in the relationship in terms of trust and so forth. And I hosted him in the United States uh, uh, on a couple of occasions as well. Nothing near as grand as the spectacle we saw when I was there. Yes, ma'am. Um, given that you were so ingrained in politics for so many years and now have retired and have maybe had the opportunity to have some better perspective as you know a member of the general public, somewhat as an outsider, more looking in now. Has that given you any opportunity to um, see any things that could be done or improved upon to, um, I, I guess my point is, given the state of politics right now in Washington, D.C., between the two parties, has being retired given you the opportunity to gain any insight into what some of those root causes are and where we're headed? This could be real easy, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, that's a serious question. And I, and, and being, I don't work for the government anymore and I'm not running for any office so I can speak freely about what things that, you know, uh, that I care about. And I don't think anybody can watch what's going on inside where I live. I live in Northern Virginia. I live inside the Beltway part of the time. I have a, fortunately I have a house outside the Beltway where sanity prevails more often than not. Um, and it's good to come back to Kansas City where real people are doing real things, trying to make a living, take care of your family, you know, blah, all the stuff we do. Um, I don't know that I have any insight. I, I traveled out, two weeks ago, I, I traveled out with Senator Dole retired from Kansas, and, um, and Elizabeth Dole, senator from, retired now, from uh, North Carolina. And they were gonna honor Senator, they honored Senator Dole at Topeka. They have a walk of honor, and he was the first recipient of having his, his name put in brass and so forth there on, on this walk. And we had a long, we had two and a half hour flight out to Topeka. Somebody donated a private, private airplane, so we were reasonably comfortable, and we're chatting, and, um, I ask him that question because, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he, has, he has the distinction of being the longest tenured majority leader in the Senate ever. And he got a lot of things done. And if you look at his, the political record when he was the majority leader, uh, there were a lot of things done that you would say, gee, I can't believe Bob Dole would have signed up for that. But he doesn't see compromise as a bad word. 
that's kind of how we, that's how our political system is, uh, is supposed to work. And when you have people dug in, you know, on each end of the spectrum, they just aren't going to give. And they'd rather see the ship go down than to save it. Um, it's, it we're, not in a good, we're not in a good spot right now. And, and you yearn for leaders like Senator Dole, who I think is, I, I can't talk for him, but I think he would, would agree that, uh, you know, that you, can, you can work a lot of things if you have a relationship, if you have some trust, and if you give a little, if you, if you give a little. And um, I think we're all looking for that leader that's going to stand up and, and, and not make it such a political statement, whatever they're working, and saying, okay, I'll take some political risk here because I think we need to move forward, whatever that is. And I think, I think we're all tired of what's going on. I mean, I, it's hard to listen to the news on these issues without just being disgusted, frankly. So, and I think, I think a lot of former leaders are. I, I keep asking, where are the Sam Nuns, the Bob Doles, Though I had a long talk with Senator John Warner, longtime senator from um, World War II veteran, senator from uh, Virginia. And uh, I actually, actually called him to get, get some dirt on Senator Dole, so I'd have something to say when I had to get him to speak for him. <laughs> but we talked about that, too. And, and, and Senator Warner was one of the, John Warner was one of those that could, could forge the way ahead and, and bring people together. And um, Sam Nunn is, was famous for doing that on the Armed Services Committee. I mean, on and on it goes. Uh, Ike Skelton, right over here, uh, not so far. I spent some time at lunch with uh, Ike last week. Uh, he's actually in a, well, no, in a real sense, he's a colleague at National Defense University. We're trying to get some congressional perspective into some of the things we do at National Defense University in our schools there, and we don't have any of that. And, and Ike is, uh, Congressman Skelton's wanting to do that. But, I mean, he had that ability as well. You know, not so dogmatic, not so doctrinaire. Goes back to the intellectual openness and agility, I think, uh, argument. So, where are those strategic leaders in our Congress? Is what you're asking, and uh, they're not. Their voices aren't aren't being heard today. It's sad. And I don't have any. That's my that's my only insight. In, is it no? Is the answer? I don't have any insight. Sorry. It's a very serious question, clearly. I have another question. <laughs> Do people get two questions? <laughs> Especially oh, mine's a good one. <laughs> no. um, it's a good one for you. Um, looking back at your career, what do you consider to be your greatest accomplishment? Oh. Well, I, you know, I, as the folks in the military can tell you, at least my view is, that you, know, you, you don't do any of this alone. I mean, the military really is a team business. And it's not just those in the military, it's families as well. So. Um, I've never looked at it that way ever, you know. Um, I remember when I got an outstanding, the unit I was commanding at Nellis Air Force Base in the mid 80s, we got an outstanding from the Major Command Inspector General Team for leadership and management. And I got all puffed up thinking, man, I'm somebody, buddy. I commanded this place, so yeah, it obviously reflects on me. And I went to the first wing meeting where the wing commander Congratulate everybody for their, their ratings and says, what have you done lately, Myers? So the, uh, the point is, I don't think, I mean, there's no, I don't, I don't know if there's any one thing you can point to. I think and if you point to it, then you have to, you have to point to 10, 100,000 other people that, that are with you. I mean, it was, it was like writing a book. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to write a book and, and be seen as trying to profit off war or any of that stuff. So all the proceeds go to charity. So I mean, you, you just can't, you can't do that. Um, we're, we're, we were all in it together. And uh, I don't, I, I just will never characterize things that way. I mean, it's, you know, there's, I think, you know, some, there's some things I'm pretty proud of and there's some things I'm not so proud of. And uh, probably rather discuss the latter. I'm not going to, but I mean, probably rather <laughs> do that than discuss the, uh, um, the, 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 the direct question. I mean, it's a good question. I just, it's just uncomfortable to answer. Given the kind of profession we were in, it's not, you know, I think um, um, in, in, in military leadership positions are a little unlike private sector leadership positions where 
I mean, it really has to be a lot more collaborative and just because of the nature of what you do, I think, to a large extent. we got time for one more, and Charlie had his hand up back there. Always be aware of the last question. <laughs> uh, general in view of the, uh, all of the defense uh, budget and resources, do you have any thoughts on in the future about how that should be shaped or distributed so that we can best fulfill our commitments both to our own nation and, and overseas? You know, that's a great, it's a great question. And I, um, my only thoughts are in the advice, I, I had, was asked to testify in front of the House Armed Services Committee several weeks ago. Uh, Chairman McKeon, Buck McKeon from California, asked several of us, of us, us retirees to come talk about that particular issue. And I think the most important thing we said to the congressional side is, you know, we know there are going to be budget cuts. There already are. The defense is already going to, they've already laid in a, over $460 billion worth of cuts over the next 10 years. That's already laid in, and they're, they're dealing with that. The question is, is there going to be another $600 billion if the Committee of 12 can't act and figure out a way out of our fiscal and our deficit issues? Uh, the advice was that when defense comes to you with cuts, ask them, try to talk about it in terms of our national security strategy and what's the risk to that strategy if we take these, whatever the cuts are. But try to, at least try to frame the debate in, in, a, in, a, in a strategy context, not just in budget cuts, not just we're gonna salami slice everybody 10%. So um, there are lots of things gonna be on the table. We could be, my personal opinion is we could be if we don't learn how to deal with the deficit and our fiscal problems and defense has to take even larger cuts in the future, we will no longer be a world power. It'll be that simple. We won't have the resources to do it. And, um, and I would argue that, um, that not just our military power but diplomatic and other, that we've been a force for good in the, in the world. And if you just look at Asia Pacific, most nations in Asia Pacific, even China up until maybe recently, would say it's been good to have the United States military forward deployed over here because they've ensured a security and stability we wouldn't have had otherwise, and that's allowed economic prosperity, not just for people in Asia Pacific, but given we're the United States is a Pacific nation, good for us too. And so that kind of security and stability in other places in the world, I think has been helpful to our own security and our own economic well-being, not to mention the, the economic prosperity of those folks in those regions. And that would, I think that becomes seriously in doubt. Uh, if we have to go through, I mean, more serious cuts. So this is really serious business. Uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. I, you know, there's, um, these are, I mean, there's a lot of competing demands today and very real demands. We've got a lot of folks out of work. So how that's gonna sort out, I don't know. But I just, I hope whatever budget cuts are put in, into some sort of strategic context. What is a strategy? How does this affect our national security strategy? What is that? Have we had to redefine it given the cuts we've already taken? and they're discussing that right now in the Pentagon. And if it has, then further cuts are gonna do what to our strategy? What can we do? What, what options will the commander in chief have or not have with a, a smaller military? And I would think the president would be very interested in that and the military ought to be able to describe that in a way that can, can at least inform the debate as they take their scalpel out. That's, that's, uh, there, there are a lot of issues we, we're dealing with, but that's, um, it's getting to the, it's getting to the serious point, <laughs> a really serious point. Before I close, thanks for the, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the opportunity to serve on the MRI board. It's uh, always fun to come back to where real, real people work and do real things and uh, in, the, in the heart of this this uh, great nation. And um, I would think it'd be pretty easy to be motivated here at MRI because you touch so many people's lives in so many different ways, not to mention our national security. I mean, this, this is, the things you do are really, really important things for our well-being as humans and our well-being as a, as a nation. I would think it'd be easy to feel good about coming to work. And that, uh, and, and occasionally you're blessed with decent leadership too. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Of course you're blessed. <laughs> no, not as leadership, no, no. no. <laughs> Tom and I have actually become, uh, I think, fairly decent friends over, because uh, we have, I'm familiar with some of the stuff they're doing and becoming more familiar with other stuff, and 
so I kind of know a little bit about some of that stuff that uh, has allowed us to have talk quite often. So uh, I'm just proud to be associated with this organization, and um, I wish you all good luck, and thank you for, for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.